online portion of Truckford. For this lecture, we'll be reviewing search and rescue. So with the search and rescue, we're going to review size up, what's involved in the primary search, and also what's involved in the secondary search. So for size up, we need to think about the dispatch information. This will be the information we'll receive from the county. And ultimately, our uh, size up does start with the dispatch. So you need to think about um, what information does the county give you? Usually the reports coming from either somebody inside the, the building or somebody adjacent to the building. They may be able to give you information as far as how many people are in the building, maybe what location they're, they're at. There are times there are, you know, 911 recordings, somebody reporting they're trapped in the second floor of the building, maybe on the front bedroom. So this was some of the information that it's going to make sense or it's going to be important to us when we're arriving on the scene to start our search and rescue operations. There may also be some information as far as who has escaped the building. So let's say the call taker may say that everybody's evacuated the building. Now that can take that with a, a grain of salt. Maybe they may think that everybody's out of the building. Um, but you know, I think to me, every space should still be searchable at some point and we should make it a priority to search those spaces. We need to understand that the the third party person, as I keep re re referring to, um, you know, is definitely giving you some information um, and really just listen to that information you know, between the time of dispatch and while you're responding. As far as size up, also think about the location of the incident. This could be the physical location of the incident or the type of incident we're responding to. If we're responding to a residential, commercial, or a mixed occupancy, think about how that may change your search tactics. Maybe the size of the building or the layout of the building. Um, residential building may have two to three bedrooms, a common kitchen area, a living room. But think if we move that into a apartment building, we're gonna have long hallways. Those apartments may be made up into one common area that's a shared space between the kitchen and the living room. We may have two to three small part, small bedrooms off of that. Or may be dispatched to a large building, maybe a mixed-use mixed occupancy. Think about downtown on College Avenue, where we have some sort of a mercantile store on the first floor, and then have apartments above that. So your access to the different areas may be different. Don't forget about the time of day. You know, we think at one point most homes were vacant during the day and then occupied in the evening and the night. That has changed now. Think about how many families are now working um, different shifts. Maybe you have one person that works night shift and one works a day shift. That means it is, it is possible you may arrive on the scene and have somebody sleeping you know, in the middle of the day and that's just because they work at night. Come to the weekends. You may have people occupying buildings you know, throughout the day on a weekend compared to Monday through Friday may only be occupied at night. So I think about other occupancies, so I did kind of touch on that a little bit as far as different types of buildings, different occupancies. We need to think about the hazards involved in the buildings and just a general size up or you know many other things that may come to mind as far as things to think about during your size up of the building. Access may be one of those. Okay, how are you going to access the building? Maybe it's faster to throw a ladder and go in the second floor window if you're searching the second floor when there's fire on the first floor. Okay, so there's a lot of things to, to think about um, for your size up. So for a primary search, what is a primary search? A primary search is a rapid systematic search. And what I mean by this is it's going to, be, it's going to happen during fire attack. So as the first line goes in the building, so does the search team. You may be working in the same room. You may be working in conjunction with um, each other. So it's not like one's going to happen before the other. The primary search is going to happen pretty quick. The other thing with this primary search, as I just talked about briefly, it's going to happen quick. Okay, So you're in there searching for trapped occupants. You're, you're, you're um, giving a, a recon of the building. You're getting a layout of the building. So if you think about when you're searching for bodies, you're searching for bigger things on your primary search. And then when you go into the secondary search, you're going to slow things down a little bit. For a primary search, it's going to be operation either between 
the interior and the exterior truck crews to complete the primary search. So you can have a crew going on the front door and then have VES or somebody with ladders um, also thrown you know, ladders to the exterior of the building, gaining access to this maybe second, third floor from the outside. Still, we are still focused on that primary quick search. So with this primary search, always work in teams. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you have to be touching or, or uh, you know, right up against within a few feet, with, you know, right up a foot from each other. But I still want you working as a team. I don't want you freelancing within the building. So if you go in with two, you come out with two. Some of the tools you're going to be taking with you as far as the search team. This is going to include the irons. So a flat-headed axe and a halogen bar. The hydro ram. Maybe a maul or a sledge. You may choose to take the A tool, O tool, or, or K tool. Any type of other tools you, you take with you. But just understand, whenever you do your primary search, you're taking hand tools with you. The biggest thing with taking hand tools with you is now you're going to be able to access locked or concealed spaces within the building. So you make your way down the hallway and the doors are locked. Now you have your tools with you. You can force the door to get inside the apartment or even if you get inside the apartment and you find somebody's locked themselves in a room, you can force the door open to get into the person. So make sure you're taking your tools with you. There are some other tools that may assist you during your primary search. Those include a, you know, a section of rope a few wedges or spring clips for the doors, a thermal imaging camera, or a flashlight. I would move the flashlight as one of the primary tools you're going to take with you for a search. Also, somebody on the crew should have a thermal imaging camera. Generally, the officer of the truck is going to work with the search team, and they're going to take the thermal imaging camera that's beside their, their seats in the, on the front seat of the truck. During your search operations, we want to stay below the heat and below the smoke. The other benefit of working below the heat and below the smoke is to give us an area where we may have some visibility compared to if we're standing up. You may be able to dock walk if it's moderate smoke. You may be able to hunch over if it's light smoke. And if you go in there and there's no smoke at all, you should be standing so you can move faster throughout the building. So in, in mindset, think about you, you arrive on the scene and there's smoke on the second floor, maybe moderate smoke on the second floor with fire in a bedroom on the second floor. Okay, there's no reason to be crawling across the first floor of the building. All right, you should be upright standing, walking across the, the first floor, then up the steps. When you get up to the upstairs and you start seeing a light smoke, this is where you may drop down and start crawling, or maybe hunched over a little bit so you can move a little faster. And then once you get into where the, you know, the closer to the fire where the smoke gets heavier, where you start feeling some heat, that's when you should be down crawling. So you can see a benefit of having a flashlight with your thermal imaging camera is just going to make it easier for you to, to move about within the building. If you're ascending stairs or going upstairs, you should be going head first. If you're coming down steps or descending steps, you should be coming down feet first. Now there's a talk about do I face the steps from coming down or do I... You know, do I look away from the steps? Whenever you're moving down a set of steps, descending a set of steps, you should be facing towards the steps, going down feet first. The idea of this is to put you in the position if for some reason you get to steps where either they're soft, they're spongy, or there's no steps at all, you're in the position to, to quickly um, climb back up the steps. So you always want to be facing the steps, whether you're going up steps or down steps. So you want to start the search as close to the fire as possible and then work out from there. So again, if the fire is on the second floor bedroom, you need to be getting as close to the, the fire as you can and work away from that point. So we think about what you know, where are the reasons for that. Think about where the, the victims are at. What's going to be the, the most unattainable or worst condition or worst space for those, the victims, is going to be the area that has the highest concentration of heat and smoke, which will be closest to the fire. Now, what I'm telling you is... If you go in the front door and you see somebody laying in front of the steps, don't walk past that person because, hey, i got to get to the, the fire first. No. If you come upon any victims on your way to the fire, then by all means, they're a priority to get them out of the building. But what I'm telling you is if the fire is on the second floor, don't search the kitchen on the first floor first and then make your way to the, the upstairs as, as the last resort. Now, you can still do a quick scan of those rooms. Again, this is a primary search, so you should be moving pretty quick. So you can, you can run in there, search the, you know, walk through the kitchen, 
walk through the living room on your way to the making your way to the second floor on the steps by all means you're still doing a primary search so moving on so a few more of the basics is to think about during your primary search we want to control the doorways that is our means of egress either into the room or out of the room you'll see a picture here we're using a flathead axe as a door chalk other chalks you could use would be a wood chalk or a spring clip. I'm sure you, those who not, don't understand what I'm talking about as far as a spring clip, you may see some of the people in our department, you know, having a, excuse me, a spring clip hooked to their gear. It's just a, a quick, easy way to attach something to a door to keep it from coming closed. The downfall of using your tools as a door chalk is now that's taking that tool out of service. Okay, so you can't really use it for anything else. So I'd, I'd rather you not use your hand tools as door chocks. So we want to work along with the hose team. We can vent as the hose team moves throughout the building. We do not want to vent in front of the hose team, if that makes any sense. Because if you vent before the hose line gets in place, then there's a good chance that fire is going to erupt or increase in size before the engine company gets in place. Now, once the engine company gets in place, then by all means, once they, you know, they have their positioning, they're, they're ready to attack the fire, then there's nothing wrong with popping a few windows to ventilate the building, but you can't do that operation until the hose line is in place. Okay, so that's a big thing. Don't open the windows until the hose line is in place. During your operations, you may be able to mark doors. So this is something that, uh, you know, it can be done. I don't carry chalk or anything in my gear it's not something I, I really think about because the chances of me reaching in my gear and pulling out a piece of chalk with a, a gloved hand it's probably not going to happen now if there is soot or smoke settling on the door maybe do an x or a, a you know a, a slash or an x pattern in the soot or write search with your finger on the soot um, but don't get too hung up on trying to mark the doors this may become more apparent or more of an operation when we get into apartment buildings, which that might be a, an idea where we're going to start you know, somehow verifying that the, all the doors have been searched or all the apartments have, have been searched. Okay, so it's up to you if you, if you want to try to do that operation. I'm just telling you don't get too hung up on it, but think at some point they may go back and ask you, has the entire floor been searched yet? And this may occur in apartment buildings, fraternities, dorms. Um, or even think a hospital or, or a healthcare facility that has multiple different doors. Another thing you could do, um, this is just a, an idea, maybe take a pillow or a blanket or something. You know, that could be your indication that you know, apartment 6A has been searched because I threw a pillow in front of the door. And then as you work down the hallway, you throw a pillow or you throw a blanket or something in front of the door. Just something that you can mark to indicate the primary search has been completed. As we move throughout the building, we should be searching systematically. That means moving from one to the other, one room to the other. You can use either a left or a right-handed search. Now, this search could change as you move down the hallway. So for the most part, you go into a residential building. You should pick a side, either left or right. You're also going to be looking for indicators of where you're at within the building, which could be a window, um, a doorway, either a locked door, an open doorway. When you move on to a second floor or you're working in a hallway, you may be able to move from, from side to side. So as we move down the hallway, we're going to first search the room on the right, and then maybe search the room across the hallway on the left, and then bounce back and forth as you make your way down the hallway. But again, a big point to this is you're searching with another teammate. You're not going to be searching alone within the building. During your search operations, it may be important for you to stop frequently to listen for the sounds of victims or listen for the sounds of the fire where it's, where it's um, actually at within the building. Other, There are a few other indicators of where you might be at in the building. So think about the hardwood floors, maybe carpet flooring. That's an indication that you're maybe close to a, a bathroom or a kitchen area. If you're on carpet, you may be in a living room area or you may be in a, re or a sleeping area, maybe a bedroom. If you feel cement or concrete floors, that would be rough to the touch. That may indicate you're in the basement. Storage areas, 
again may have a combination of either a linoleum floor or a hardwood floor, maybe even carpet. Walkways may have also have linoleum or a finished concrete. So just understand that what you feel, so you get in an area where you can't see anything, feel the walls around you, feel the floor, maybe an indication of where you're at. Whenever I say you need to slow your breathing down or you just need to listen to what's going on, that means hold your breath or if you can, slow your breathing down and listen. You may hear someone, you may hear the fire, or you may hear other indicators of what's going on within the building. Why holding your breath? Turn your head around. Okay, so look to the left, look to the right, use your flashlight, do a sweep, see if you hear anything going on. Okay, so, so keep yourself pretty mobile or your head on a swivel whenever you're doing your search operations. It is beneficial every once in a while. Stop for a sec. You may find yourself disoriented in the building at times. Okay, that doesn't mean you need to, to pull the panic button and, and scream and yell and run out. Um, if you get disoriented, find your, make your way into a corner. Okay, so most rooms have you know, at least four corners. Um, while you're searching for a, a corner of the room, get to the outside wall and may find a window. You might be able to look out the window and get an orientation of what side of the building you're on. Um, if you need to, use your hook if you have, your hook or your halogen bar, maybe tap on the wall. If you're tapping on the wall, you may you know, hear or feel a window. Again, that's going to give you an indication of where you're at. Um, and, and once you find one of those points, you can start again. Okay, so you might find an anchor and then get your bearings about you again and then you can proceed from that point. Also, pay attention to where your partner is at. As I said before, you don't need to be touching the entire time. At least I'd rather, if I'm searching with somebody, I don't want you close enough that you're constantly grabbing onto my foot. But I am going to have constant communication with you at some point or during the operation. We will have constant, continuous communications. Hey, are you over here? Are you over there? I'm moving into this room. Are you behind me? I'm going to search ahead of you. Can you see my flashlight? That's the type of operations you're going to have between you and your search partner. So you need to make sure that you're in constant communication with them. All right, as I said before, again, you don't have to be touching. you got to be talking. All right, so when you move into the room, you want to make sure that you search the middle of the room. Okay, so you're going to search the middle of the room and then the exterior walls. Um, you're going to need to feel around. So again, this is primary search. This is a quick search. You're looking for bodies. You're looking for people. So if, you're, if somebody's laying on the bed, you're going to do a quick scan of the bed. You're going to scan across the bed. You're going to scan under the bed. You know, check, you know, let's say, think about most bedrooms. You may have a, some sort of a dresser, um, a bed, a nightstand. You're going to be looking for areas where a person would generally be laying if they, if they went down, if they passed out. Again, this is your primary search looking for, for our bodies. Okay. If you're going to use your tool to search with, be careful with that. So if I'm going to hold on to an axe, I want to hold on to the head of the axe and, and use the, the handle as my extension. I don't want to be swinging the uh, axe blade around within the room. Same if I was using a four foot or six foot hook. Again, I would be holding on to the, the hook part of the tool and then searching with the blunt end so I don't hit or you know, cause any type of injury to the person I may be searching for. So during our primary search, we want to communicate with our incident commander. We want to advise them of our operations. Now, I'm not telling you, and please don't give your incident commander a play-by-play -play of everything you're doing within that room. Important things, okay, if you're searching throughout, if you complete your search, that's something important to tell your incident command. If you're moving from floor to floor, if that's important, make sure you tell incident command. If you find somebody, important, tell incident command. If you find a pocket of fire, important, tell command. Okay, these are important you know, key points of the incident that need to be portrayed out to command, but don't tell them every little thing that you're going to be doing inside the building. All right, so we move on to secondary search. Secondary search is once the, the fire is under control, we're going to slow things down, and this is where we want to go through and look at every part of that building, 100%. So as I said before, the, the primary search will be a quick search, pretty down and dirty, you're moving quick, you're trying to search the whole building, um, you know, as I, again, very quickly. Whenever we move on to a secondary search, even though this should be a thorough search, this should be, you know, I'm not going to use the term unlimited time, but you got, you have quite a bit of time to search the building. So this is when you're going to check the corners, 
you know, check between the, 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 the dresser and, you know, the, the bed or behind the bed. Um, you know, all those little spots where somebody may end up would be a secondary search. I guess I could say the primary search is where they most likely be at. Now, there are times where people have been found in um, unexpected areas. So vacant buildings, people have been found in non-living areas, inside vehicles, children have been found hidden within buildings. I believe at one point, I have to search where this actually occurred, but they were tearing a building down. So think about you know how much time is between the actual fire and the building was being torn down. And I believe they found a body inside you know, a cabinet or something in the, in the kitchen, something weird like that. All right, so, so make sure on primary on, on the secondary search, we are searching every nook and cranny of the building. So with this secondary search, a different crew should be doing the secondary search compared to those who do the, the, the primary search. This puts fresh air, fresh eyes on the building. Um, redundancy will be, will increase um, our success. So we're going to maybe have in search, you know, the one crew goes in and does the primary search, a different crew goes in and does the secondary search. Now we have um, different ideas or different areas, not just the same people doing it twice. Also, the primary search crews may not be available because they are going to be in rehab. Okay, so just think we're, we're further into the incident when we said a second crew in to do a secondary search. As I said before, speed is not as, cru as critical during the secondary search. Um, so, but though it should be much more thorough. During the secondary search, there shouldn't be any ideal H, um, atmosphere or anything we need to worry about as far as that. Now, there are times you're going to be doing a secondary search, you're still breathing air. Okay, it just depends on when or the, the severity of the incident. Maybe the primary search goes through. We didn't locate anybody. We're still missing somebody. We send the secondary search crew in. Again, you're still work breathing air. You still may have other operations going on but it's a priority to find whatever we're looking for within the building and that's where we do a, a more in-depth secondary search. Again use a systematic search during your secondary search going from room to room. Once one is complete move on to the second. Um, try to when I say systematic I don't mean that like you search the first floor for a little bit then bounce and go upstairs for a second then back to the first floor then back up in the attic. You know clear you know each floor um, before moving on to the second air, the second area, um, just try to be systematic about it. And truly, on the second air search, we're looking for un unaccounted for victims, um, ensuring that everybody is, is, that is unaccountable is found, or they need to be located at some point. So, if you think about it, a secondary search, may not be just within the building. For having an account of unaccounted for person, we may be searching the outside of the building. We may be searching other buildings on the property. We may be making phone calls to neighbors. We may be making phone calls to um, the hospital. Maybe somebody was taken to the hospital. So we need so a, a secondary search is, can be or could be very extensive until we can locate that missing person. During the secondary search, we may also be looking for sources of ignition or this may be part of the fire investigation. So even if the fire investigators are not on the scene yet, um, during a secondary search, we may be slowing things down a little bit and start to identify these potential areas of, of um, points of origin. We wanna make sure that we communicate all of our findings to incident command. This occurs both during primary and our secondary search. We wanna make sure the incident command knows what we're doing. So let the command know when you move from the first floor or you know, command primary or secondary search is complete on the first floor. Search team is moving to the second floor, and then when you're searching the second floor, again call command command from search team. Secondary search is complete on the second floor. We're moving to the third floor. So let command know how you're how you're moving throughout the building or your the, any updates on your search. So moving on to search methods. All right, I've kind of touched on some of this already. Whenever we're working on the fire floor, we want to, again, work from the, the most hazardous area back towards the area that is, has the least damage. So we will be working near active fire, which is releasing a lot of, a lot of energy, both heat and smoke. We need to think about the horizontal pathways that may be open 
um, for fire spread. So the things we may open up, I'd say we're working down the hallway and we open the door to go into the fire room to do a search. We need to understand that we just opened the doorway that may increase the, the size of the fire because we're letting in fresh oxygen. We need to be accountable for or watch out for rollover and flashover. We may open the door, search the room quick, and then close the door. And we're going to stand by for the hose line to get in place. So we need to be watching for indicators of fire spread. If we're working or above the fire floor during our search operations, understand that heat and smoke is going to rise. That we're putting ourselves in an area above the fire. We're also working ahead of the the um, engine company. So tools we may, where we bring with us for the search would also be a pressurized water can. We need to understand that that's not a hose line, that's only a protection line. That we want to use, our, use that as protection for ourselves and also if we find a small fire to knock the small fire down. If there is a large fire we want to close the door and then use that pressurized water can to keep the fire from spreading throughout the building as best we can. Okay, so we just understand that water can is not a hose line. It's not going to have the same force uh, or the same ability as to knock fire down. We need to be concerned about auto exposure if we're working on the floor above. So auto exposure would be if the, if I say the fire is on the second floor and the window fails. The fire extends out the window up the side of the building and then a window on the third floor fails and then the fire travels inside the building. So from the, first, from the second floor out a window up the side of the building and then back into the building. That would be auto exposure, something we need to be concerned about, again, if we're searching above the fire. If we're working on the top floor, understand that's where the smoke and heated gases are going to build up. So even if the fire is on the second floor in an apartment building and we're up searching the, the top floor, at some point those smoke and heated gases are going to collect on the floor that we're working on. So we need to think about you know all the tools we bring with us and making sure that we have our SCBA, our positive air supply, whenever we're working in these areas. During the primary search, um, doors that give access or means of egress or entering egress into unaffected rooms should be closed. So once the room is searched, make sure you close the door and keep that door closed. One that's going to limit fire spread throughout the building also, it's going to limit smoke, thread, smoke spread throughout the building. So try to keep the doors closed um, as best you can. For hallways or for exit areas, okay, these do become choke points, so become issues. As the fire ground operations continue, it may be a, an operation that the command or the search team decides that one stairwell is going to be used for entrance and egress, and the other stairwell is going to be used for fire attack, which would be the hose lines something to think about. The biggest thing is we need to keep these egress areas clear. So if you're going to be working in the hallway, work quick. Get off the stairwell. Or, or get in, and if you're working in the hallway, don't, excuse me, don't try to you know, clutter it up. Um, don't leave your tools. Don't leave your tools lay around. Um, if you find a victim, then bring those tools with you. If you, you know, run out of hands, you can't carry your howling bar and your... You can try to move your hand tools, you know, maybe near, near a doorway or in the corner of the room. Just that way, once you come back into the building, you'll be able to find your hand tools and then continue your search. Okay, so please don't just let your tools lay um, if you get into the operations of moving somebody um, from the building. All right, so for uh, searching down through a hallway... So we can do a, an operation where we bounce from, from side to side, or we're just going to work together as a, as a crew. So if you're working with two, mem two people on your crew, um, both members may enter the apartment and split. One goes to the left, one goes to the right, you meet at the other side, and you loop back around, you come back out, and you move on to a different apartment. If you're working with a two-member crew, you may also split yourselves. So one member of the crew acts as an anchor, so you get to the doorway, that one member stays there why the other member goes in, searches that apartment, and then comes out to the, the waiting member. You can do this from you know, one side, so you search, let's say in this hallway, you search the room on the right side, one member goes in, one stays at the doorway, you search the room, you come back out, and now you leapfrog or you, you flip. You go to the room to the left, or on the other side of the hallway, the person who just finished searching would now become the anchor for that doorway. 
and then the other person who was the anchor is now becomes the search person and they're going to search so that gives you a little bit of a, a break between the search operations if you're working with a three-member crew this could generally mean the officer and two interior firemen then the officer is going to be act as the anchor it's going to stay at the doorway while the other two firemen search that room then come back to the, the officer waiting at the doorway if the officer has their thermal imaging camera they may also scan the room and give you an indication of which area this room needs to be searched or they can search the main room while the other two members search the other rooms you can bounce it again from side to side so again the same idea would happen if you have a three member crew then you just move across the hallway to the other side it is possible to move down one side of the hallway and then come back to the other side but it's really not efficient you think about the amount of time it's going to take to go down search and come back up that hallway I would rather see you just search from side to side room on the right and then room on the left when you go into the apartment we're still gonna or into the apartment or any room that we're gonna search we're still gonna choose whether we're gonna do a right-handed or a left-handed search we, we want to choose that at the beginning and stay with that we don't want to bounce around and go into the room on the right side or the right-handed and then halfway through switch and try to use the left hand that's just gonna mix you up and get you and you turned around within the room so whatever one you start with that's the one you're gonna finish with so try to leave the room through the same door you entered. This is going to keep you from getting mixed up in the room. Um, there are multiple rooms within a building that you know, go from one to the next. I can think of a residential house that has a, a large uh, master bedroom. From the master bedroom, you go into a, a, a decent size bathroom, and then from that bathroom into a walk-in closet. So for that, you'd be moving from one room to the next and to the next. Uh, and just really make sure that you're, you're coming out the same way. The other thing is if you get an operation like this, make sure that whoever you're working with knows you're moving from one room to the next. And that way they can be an anchor at that doorway. And they can be a guide for you both to get back out of the room. There are some other search methods. Um, you, so you can use a search rope. So understand that both of the trucks and the rescue carry a search rope. For us, the search rope is going to be 200 feet. Every 20 feet, there is going to be a knot. And those knots are an indication of how far from the anchor point you are on that rope line. So if you get to a point where you feel one knot, that's 20 feet. Two knots is 40 feet. Three knots is 60 feet. Four knots is 80 feet. So whatever the number of knots you're at times 20 gives you an indication of how far from that anchor point you are. The other thing that goes along with the search rope would be a tagline. You can use a 20 foot tagline and then extend yourself off of that point. So you could stretch a rope line or search rope through a large building and then at the 20 foot mark or at the 40 foot mark then you attach another tagline you work 20 feet off of that which gives you some movement and it's really just giving you a roadway or a fixed point to get yourself back out of the building. For marking doors, I did previously mention the, the option of marking doors. Now, I said before, using a piece of chalk, getting it out of my pocket is probably not going to be um, really useful or actually going to happen. Um, but if you would do that, or somehow you may be marking this in the soot that's on the doorway, one slash means you're starting your primary search. The second slash marks, second, second slash mark indicates the primary search is complete or it puts an X on the doorway. Then moving on, whenever you start the secondary search, so the secondary search will be another slash mark on top of the um, initial X. And then to indicate that the secondary search is complete could be the second slash mark on the second X or creating two X's on the door. Or if you put a circle around the X is also an indication that that room has been searched twice or a primary and a secondary has been completed. A few search guidelines. Do not enter the fire area in which the fire has progressed to the point where viable victims are, are not likely to be found. So it is possible for a, a, a person to survive, still um, be viable in a smoky area or, or an area that has thick smoke. Just think about their positioning. They're laying on the floor. Um, there could still be enough oxygen to keep them alive. Now I understand if somebody is trapped or, or within a room that is you know, completely involved in fire or if you arrive on the scene and you have heavy fire 
venting from a window, there's a very good chance that, that that room has been compromised to the point where it's not a survival space for a victim. There, there may be other points within that building that are still survivable due to smoke conditions. Um, but truly, if you get into an area that has a flame or fire, that's probably not going to be survivable. So you need to think about that as far as how far you're going to push into a building for your primary search, depending on the amount of fire that's located within that building. During your operations, be cautious of the conditions for backdraft or the potential for backdraft. So generally a condition or an indication of backdraft is smoke and no flame, which just means that the fire is at a point where it's, it's somewhat smothered. It doesn't have enough oxygen to reach a fully developed fire, so it's stuck in that K phase. So it can give you a lot of smoke with very limited or even limited smoke, just no fire. So be cautious of that whenever you're opening the building up to make access to start your operations. Please no freelancing on the fire ground. Please work with another member. If you, um, for some reason, have to work by yourself, please let, make sure somebody knows where you're working at. Um, as I again say, please no freelancing. If you if you get for some reason you get split from somebody, find a crew to work with. Um, if you get split up and you do find a crew, let command know that you are split from your initial teammate, and then you've found another. You're working with another team. And that way they know that for some, you know, we need to locate where your, your teammates at and get accountability for them. You want to maintain contact with command. Now, again, I said before, this doesn't need to be a play-by-play -play operation of what you put into. Just let them know where you're operating at within the building or has conditions change. So if you're on the first floor and you're, you're completing a primary search, then that would be something you're going to tell command. You've completed the primary on the first floor, you're moving to the second. And then once you're on the second command starting, the, sec uh, the primary search on the second floor, also want to know if you find fire on the second floor, or if conditions change from what you think would be normal, advise command of that. If you leave that fire floor, that would be something else you'd want to advise command of. So they know wh where you're working at within the building. For search, um, for a few more search guidelines, just stay alert to what's going on around you, understand as the building burns, the structural integrity of the building is going to be reduced. There may be some indications for trapped victims. Again, if you're doing a 360 of the building, you find a, a sheet or a, a pillow laying beside the building, um, look up. There's a good chance the window might be open or somebody may have got themselves into that room, opened the window, threw a sheet or a blanket out or a pillow, just trying to put some indication out there that, hey, I'm trapped inside here. And that may lead you to a trapped victim. There are some homes now that are using either a tot finder or a pet finder. It's just an indication of which rooms in the house may be the, a, a child's bedroom. You may also find a, a pet finder sticker at the bottom of a front, the front door of the building or the back door as the main entry and egress routes. This is just an indication that there are pets within the, in the home and that look out for them during your search. We should be using the established accountability system within our department. So we have a two-tag system. Just to review for that two-tag system, whenever you're riding the apparatus or you're on the apparatus, your first tag should be attached to the apparatus. Once you arrive on the scene, your second tag is going to go you know, to accountability whenever you get your assignment. For some reason, you get dispatched for an incident, you're riding in the apparatus, your first tag goes on the key ring or on the ring within the apparatus. If you arrive on the scene, you've been assigned to go to work or your company's going to work, whether you're going to work for search or, or ladders or whatever operation you get into, if accountability has not been established, then drop your second tag on the floor below your seat. And then once the accountability officer has been established, and then they'll go around and collect your tags and put your put you with your company and your assignment. Beware of secondary means of egress within the building. Um, be cautious whenever you're putting ladders in place um, that you're not blocking second means of egress. Just understand that most all buildings should have a second way out, whether it's the front door or the back door or other windows, um, other escape routes. 
So just be aware of those if you're in the building and you, you do locate a, a trapped victim. It may not always be possible or always a requirement to bring them out the same way you went in. There's a good chance you've made your way to the back of the building. There may be another exit on the back of the building, which is much closer and much faster for egress than bringing the person back through the building itself. Whenever you're working inside the building or completing your search and rescue operations, make sure you're wearing full PPE. Um, this includes all your gear, your SCBA. You should also have your flashlight with you and your forced entry tools. You should be moving systematically throughout the building. What I mean by this is if you go in, you start your primary search on the first floor or you make your way to the fire and then work your way back. You really shouldn't be doing your uh, leapfrog type bounce throughout the building of you're working on the first floor, then you go to the attic, and then you go to the second floor, and back to the first floor, and back to the second floor. Try to complete your searches on the entire floor before moving on to a different floor. You want to main, maintain contact with the wall um, when your visibility is obscured. Now I understand you're not going to be touching the wall all the time because there's beds and chairs and couches and everything else against the wall. But at some point, as you move through your operation, every once in a while, go back, find the wall, reorient yourself, and then continue your search from that point. During your operation, you want to stay as low as possible and move cautiously throughout the building. What I mean by that is move cautiously. You shouldn't be moving to the point where you're moving so fast that you're going to be tripping over things or getting you know, caught up in wires or, or falling over a chair or something. So move with a purpose, but move cautiously. I already reviewed using the search rope, so if you feel that's necessary, then by all means use a search rope, anchor it either outside um, or a secure point, and then work off of that, that area. We should have a hose line in the building, or the hose line should end up in the building at some point. So depending on where you have the, the victim at, you may use that hose line as protection. And then coordinate with the hose line before opening windows during your search operation. Um, for that, just understand if you start opening up the building too quick, you're going to increase the, the fuel load or the, the oxygen to that fire, which will increase the size of the fire and make conditions let, a lot less tenable for both yourself and any victims that may be inside the building. During your operations, you want to check the doorways before, or the door, the door handle before you open the door, uh, maybe even before opening the, the door, holding on the door handle. Look around that door, so you're looking for indications of smoke or fire. You may see some warping on the door. You may see it starting to change color. That's just an indication that there's fire on the other side of the doorway. It's something we need to be cautious with. If you find those conditions, use your, your water can, your PW. Try to knock the fire down or at least keep it from spreading from that room. So for this firefighter here, I'd say we get to this point. We have smoke you know, around the doorway. We see some flame there. We open the door. We see fire inside. We do a quick search. We close the door. And then we're going to use our water can to keep that door secured. So maybe every once in a while, every few seconds, spray the, the top of the doorway with the hose line or with their um, water can and try to cool the top of the door. Try to keep it intact as long as you can. You don't want the fire spreading from that room into the hallway and then possibly spreading into other areas of the building. So try to keep the fire contained as best as possible. You want to complete the or report the completion of your searches or any fire conditions or locations of fire to command. So you want to pass this information on to instant command and other members of the room or of the search. Um, one of the other things I want to kind of touch on is you may not always bring the, the victim back out the same way you went in. Or it may, be, may not make sense to, to bring a, a person out of a, a secure room, let's say with the door shut and the windows open and really no smoke conditions inside that room, from that point back out through the building if it's not necessary. So this, this case happened in uh, Harrisburg where I think believe they had a, a small fire on the first floor, maybe it was a kitchen fire with minimal extension throughout the building and they located a, a large obese person in a second floor bedroom. Instead of bringing that, that person you know, threw out the fire building to get them outside. What they did is they sheltered them in place. They closed the door. They brought a hand line in as protection for that person. And I believe they also put the person on SCBA, either an SCBA or, or connected them to a RIT pack. 
And what the crew did was they stayed with that person until the fire was knocked down, until conditions um, increased, until conditions got better, and then they brought the person out of the building. So you may, at times, it may make more sense to protect in place than bring the person out of the building. And that just goes along with the victim removal, as I just talked about. Um, if the person is in a, a immediately dangerous area or immediately dangerous IDLH, immediately dangerous to the life and health area, then you want to get them out of the building as, as quick as possible. Um, but also understand if you're going to a, a large apartment complex and the person is up on the third floor and the fire is on the first floor and you really don't feel that the fire is going to spread to that point, then protect that person in that area until everything is, is controlled and then bring them out of the building. For egress of victims, there are a few different directions we can go with them, either interior stairs, horizontally out windows. You can take them horizontally out a window onto a fire escape, out a window onto a ladder, or out a window and use a life safety rope. By all means, I would say it's a life safety rope. Lowering somebody, that's you got to have a really good reason why you're going to do that. Um, you know, if, you, if all means are blocked and there's no other access, the truck can't get in place, the aerial can't get in place, there's no fire escape, you know, the conditions are worsening, but using interior steps is going to be the, the best way, the fastest way to bring somebody out of the building and from that point move on to either using ladders or in the aerial bucket. So we're going to talk about VIS or VES, Vent Enter Isolate Search, Vent Enter Search. This, think of this as searching the building from the outside in compared to the inside out. So you see this member makes their way to the porch roof. They've ventilated the structure. They've taken the windows. Their next op oper or the next plan is going to be to enter that apartment or enter that, that room. They're going to search the room and then make their way back out. The I part of VIS is isolate. So you want to ventilate, enter. You want to make your way to the doorway for that apartment or for the, excuse me, for that room and shut the door. That's going to isolate you from the smoke, the heat of gases inside the building. Try to make your, the area you're working a little more tenable. You want to search that space and then come back outside. So the big takeaway from this is when you enter doing VEIS, make sure you isolate or shut the door and keep the smoke and heat of gases inside the building and isolate yourself into that room, search the room, and then get out. All right, so this is the com completion of the search and rescue module for truck pert. Please complete the quiz located in the description section of the YouTube video. If you have any questions, ask the captain or the lieutenant of the truck company, or you can stop in the office and ask the assistant chief for training any questions you may have. Um, this is just a prelude to what you're going to be doing during your hands-on operations for search and rescue in the truck program. Again, thank you for your participation, and we'll see you on the training grounds.